Hi everyone, welcome to the Noah Central Library. Um, we're here for Deirdre Byrne's talk, Dr. Deirdre Byrne, and we're going to have, um, she's going to be introduced by Krista Arzaeus. Krista Arzaeus. <laughs> Thank you guys. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Krista Arzaeus from the IUS Program Office, and it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Deirdre Byrne. Uh, she is a physical oceanographer with a passion for science and service to an environmentally sustainable and resilient society. She has taken that passion with her throughout her career, starting with her getting her PhD at Columbia University's Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory. She followed that with a career uh, in academia at the University of Maine. And then where I met Deirdre was at uh, NCEI, and she was there with NESDIS uh, from 2010 to 2015 before her current appointment uh, in South Africa at the Oceans and Coast Branch of the Department of Environmental Affairs. Her geographic area of specialization is the ocean around Southern Africa, and she has a strong interest in research to operations and in operational oceanographic systems and products. So I'm guessing we're going to hear a lot about all of that in her talk. So thanks, dear Joe. We're glad you're here. Thanks. Thanks. Um, actually, what I'm going to talk about today is not so much what I'm doing, but a project that I'm I'm involved with. I, I sit on the steering committee for it, but I thought it I thought it would be of interest to people at NOAA. So rather than talking about what I do, I'm going to talk about this project, and I'll kind of highlight where where we're involved. But um, and the project is. Uh, the acronym for the project, everybody has to have an acronym, is OSIMS, or National OSIMS, um, and we'll get into that. And I, virtually every slide I'm going to show you is not mine, so <laughs> this is, was a presentation that was put together by the former OSIMS project director, uh, Dr. Neil Milan, who has since retired from Oceans and Coasts. Um, so thank you, Neil, and any, any inaccuracies or errors are, are surely mine, because um, he's a very thorough guy. So. Just bear, bear that in mind. Um, so the project is called National OSIMS, and, um, and here I am. Um, and my, <clears throat> my official email is somewhat flaky. So if you do write to me and, and you don't hear for two or three days, it could be that I just can't access the email server. I've been lobbying since I got there for us to use Google Mail, because it's uptime is so great, and it's reliable, and you have that cool G Suite collaboration. I'm getting closer, because we had a power outage and the generator didn't kick in, and all our official email for our whole department was out for about three days, and that includes approvals of all the procurements and stuff because it's done in an online system, and all our travel that sends people email. So I wrote to the CI, and I was like, "Really? You don't want to? You don't want these headaches? Let's outsource our email." Anyway, um, okay. So I'm going to talk about the background of OSIMS, what it is, what it what it's meant to do, how did it come about in South Africa. Um, kind of where we are with it and where we're hoping to go, who we're trying to support. Um, okay, so OSIMS was started by something with an interesting name, Operation Pakisa Initiative 6. So um, Operation Pakisa um, is something that in Malaysian means big, fast results, and it's something that South Africa borrowed. South Africa takes looks around at other developing countries and kind of goes, what's, what's the best practice here? And the Malaysians had done some really successful stuff like, for example, they would set a very specific goal. We want to reduce the waiting time in hospital emergency rooms to 20 minutes or less. How can we achieve that? And then they get together all the players, hospital admins, they, you know, doctors, nurses, everybody, and they figure out how they're going to achieve it and then they roll it out. And um, it's been really successful. Um, South Africa took this model They've deployed it on much bigger questions like, how can we grow the ocean economy for South Africa? And just to put this in perspective, the unemployment rate in the like, I want to say it's like the 18 to 35 age category in South Africa is close to 50%. It's enormous. It's absolutely enormous. Now, you won't see that if you go to a city because that's not where the unemployment is. The unemployment is in rural areas where people are scraping by with subsistence farming or sitting and collecting a, a tiny stipend. Um, so um, the, the economic potential, South Africa has a lot of coasts and a lot of continental shelf. Um, and they looked at things like developing aquaculture, both land-based aquaculture and net pen aquaculture. Um, they looked at, um, it has a relatively 
what I consider along the coast a relatively sophisticated infrastructure. So they looked at things like servicing oil rigs, right? Because they've got the harbors and they've got technically skilled people. They looked and they decided they could create a lot of jobs and potentially a lot of uh, add to the GDP a lot just to translate 10 to 15 billion for a country like that. That's significant. Um, the largest share by far, the lion's share, when I actually sat down and read the report, it was like 80% of it was from the oil industry, which isn't surprising, right? But um, from my perspective, there's a tremendous amount that we can do in environmental affairs to make, um, for example, in, enhance safety for, for small scale fishermen, um, fisher people, um, or to promote more sustainable management of ocean resources as they start to be uh, more exploited. So that's, that's kind of where my interest comes in um, and our, our department's interest. So, um, <laughs> This, this is the way it was framed as a problem. Sever, several other countries, and I want to highlight that the USA is one of these countries, have dedicated oceans and coastal information management systems. And when I saw the US listed in there, I had to laugh because I was like, if you think about it, it's not, it's not one information system. You think about the number of information systems running at NOAA right now, the provider, <laughs> it's not a system. It's like a lot of systems, but um, it's being held up as an example. Um, and so South Africa adheres to a lot of international conventions for things and participates in a lot of international stuff, but there was really no real-time accessibility to either basic data sets or enhanced products coming from them. And there's been a variety of legislation and also position papers coming through parliament that, that basically mandate us to do that, right? You, we need to have comprehensive information available about our marine space and our coastal zone. Um, so OSIMS is being designed to help address this need. Um, it's not, even though it's called the Oceans and Coastal Information Management System, it is not an information management system. It's a decision support system. So it's, uh, its purpose is to pro pro provide a synthesized view of a bunch of different factors. Is it okay to mine here, offshore mining, or not? Is there a protected species? Is it in the middle of a marine protected area? Is there some other thing? Can you put a sewage outflow here or not? What's the, um, what are the ocean currents like there? Um, where is it likely to go? So, if, but um, we're stuck with that. <laughs> we're stuck with the acronym. So we just go ahead. Um, so um, those of you who are, who are in this domain will know that the length of your coastline totally depends on the length of the ruler used to measure it. So this is a totally arbitrary number, but based on some common map scale, uh, South Africa has about 3,000 kilometers of coastline, and um, very much like the United States, has a larger EEZ than a terrestrial area. And I think they, there, there are not a lot of countries in that category. Most of the other ones are like Pacific Island states. So um, big ocean area and um, it's also a very open ocean area. There, there aren't big estuarine or protected areas or inland seas or things like the Gulf of Mexico. It's really open, it's facing the Southern Ocean and the conditions are quite extreme um, as are the ocean currents. Um, and South Africa has a, two islands down there. They're confusingly called the Prince Edward Islands. Um, <laughs> One of which is Marion Island, and I think the other one is Prince Edward Island. So that extends the, the easy by a lot. Um, right, so we need cost-effective ways to, to manage and monitor the space, and that's, um, and there's an extended continental shelf claim that's being educated, I don't know, in the UN maybe, is that where they do it? Um, so that would increase the amount of space that South Africa is supposed to manage. In addition to this, and I don't think it's part of this, South Africa has the largest um, meteorological, uh, marine meteorological area, I think, of any country, because it, it goes with the South Africa all the way down to Antarctica, that we're supposed to provide alerts and uh, sea rescue and all those functions that um, are agreed on internationally. Okay, so Operation Pakisa, as I mentioned, it means big, fast results, I think, in Malaysian. Um, it's a very unique initiative. It comes straight from the president's office. Um, the president has switched now, but the initiative continues. Um, there are five focus areas, marine transport and small harbor development, offshore oil and gas, aquaculture, marine protection and ocean governance. This is where we come in and enhancing coastal tourism. Tourism is a really big economic driver in South Africa, ecotourism in particular. 
Um, there we are. Okay, so um, I don't know why this slide is here, so let's just see. Uh, these are some of the activities that are happening under this. Um, one of them is, uh, just I'll just talk to the one on the right, is marine spatial planning. So that's actually collecting together um, essentially the authoritative information about it. Where, where is the high tide line? What are the boundaries of marine protected areas? Um, what kind of benthic surveys have been done and where are, where are there um, managed or protected species? All kinds of information like that, again, um, in an authoritative way and to provide those for planning purposes, um, which hasn't been done in South Africa before. Um, so, okay, so there we are. This is Operation Pakisa Ocean Protection Initiative 6 which the only reason that matters is because when they have meetings, they say we have an initiative six meeting. We're like, what's six again? But um, extending Earth observation capacity. Um, it's kind of a misnomer. Uh, OK, so um, we as a department were tasked with delivering this national oceans and coast information management system, which we then wrote up as a contract and contracted out. Um, the Department of Science and Technology was tasked with extending Earth observation technology and implementing Earth observation. What they've taken that to be is they have a microsatellite development project, um, and we're looking for ways to make microsatellites useful. And the other one is they're purchasing satellite imagery like stuff from radar sat that, that we need. They haven't extended it. I would like to see it include non-satellite platforms, <laughs> but EO nowadays is really taken as satellite stuff. So I've been talking to them about some technologies I think would be advantageous. I'm hoping they could see it as part of their mandate to, to maybe co-support it with us. Um, just as an example, like HF radar, I think would be really useful for the country, particularly given um, the extreme marine conditions. It's really valuable to have a shore-based technology. Um, and given the extremely limited number of ships, it's very difficult for us to get out and service things. Um, so there is no, there is no UNOS fleet. Um, we have an Antarctic vessel. We have one marine vessel. Um, and fisheries has a marine vessel. And that's about it. And they're all like 30 to 40 years old. So yeah, so I think HF Rider would be a good match uh, for, for what we need. So I'm trying to get them to just Anyway, um, so on to OSIMS. What is OSIMS and what are the decision support tools? What are you talking about? This is what it looks like if you go to the website. Um, it's to develop a technological solution um, that essentially supports the economic growth and conservation. So you don't want just people trashing the environment and going, oops, later on. You want to actually support growth in an environmentally sustainable way. And South Africa is a hotspot for biodiversity, so it's really important. Um, and the idea is to integrate stuff that exists and develop stuff that's um, close to being ready, um, and even, in my view, we have to develop stuff that we see as a critical gap that doesn't exist. Um, and put it together in a package um, to help people make decisions and operate in, in the maritime and coastal zone. Um, and the, the vision is to make this a world-class system. Um, another part of the vision on a more technical note is to use open source stuff. So, okay, so um, it's involved a lot of partnerships and developing partnerships. Um, South Africa is a, is a free democracy, is a very young country. I think we're in year 23 now. And so um, channels that you might expect to see between agencies don't always exist in terms of communication or sharing data. Um, and they actually have to be developed. The South African National Space Agency is actually really young. It's like three years old or five years old or, so um, I had an interesting meeting with them recently, and they said, we have a mandate to steward all the remote sensing you know, satellite data for the nation. And I said, that's great. What infrastructure do you have? And they said, well, we don't have any yet. <laughs> but that's our mandate. And I'm like, great. So we'll put up some storage, and you can brand it. And then when you're ready, <laughs> we can put stuff over there. As long as we can tag it and give it UUIDs and, and make it searchable and accessible through the APIs we need, that's fine, but for right now, we'll we'll just keep building out our storage, and and it, you can just put your moniker on it, you know. 
This is the Sansa Marine Remote Sensing Storage Facility in Cape Town. Um, and they were like, oh. Um, so then I gave them copies of ISO 14721 and 16363 and said, you know, if you're going to steward Earth observing data, these are really good ISO standards to know about. So, um, yeah, so we're, we're making. Um, we're making progress, and um, it's been very encouraging, actually. When we started out, um, some of these departments were like, what, what does this have to do with us? I talked to the Navy early on, and I said, um, would you be interested in better information and real-time information about ocean surface currents or subsurface conditions? And I don't know who was on the other end of the line. Some Navy community said, not really. I said, really? He said, well, it doesn't matter. We have to go out anyway. And I was like, okay, <laughs> that's not quite what I was expecting to hear. But, you know, um, but if you talk to the Navy now, you get a very different answer. Um, I think they're starting to see, um, yeah, I was like, okay. Uh, yeah, um, they're starting to see the value of, of having better intel before they go out. And um, just to put it in perspective, so South Africa has five ships in its Navy. It has a Navy. Um, and if you look at the two neighboring countries on either side, they don't have navies at all. So in my mind, the only reason that like you can safely take a boat off the coast of South Africa and aren't immediately at risk for being snatched by pirates is because South Africa has a navy. So I'm really glad they're there and I would like to help them do their job. You know? And they actually literally patrol up, like they have like a five country zone that they patrol because there isn't anybody else to do it. Um, so um, let's see, pollution. Yes, another problem that South Africa has is bilge dumps and oil spills and stuff like that, and who's responsible and how do you tell. And um, so this is just our, um, our organizational structure. Um, here's the project steering committee where I sit. And then we've got um, technical advisory groups for each one of So before I even came to South Africa, they had decided on a handful of decision support tools they thought were technically feasible using stuff that was fairly mature. For example, um, South African researchers had already developed a pretty robust algorithm for detecting harmful algal blooms from ocean color. So they said, okay, so if we can make this real time and add an alert system and maybe customize it a little more, um, this could be a really useful tool for the burgeoning aquaculture industry. In particular, um, the shellfish industry, there's um, oysters and abalone, um, and they're land-based, but they pump seawater. And so if they know ahead of time that there's a hab coming, they can turn off the pumps, right? So um, IVT is Integrated Vessel Tracking. It's also known, and it's kind of, it's also known as Maritime Domain Awareness, depending on who you talk to, but it just means in a, what ships are in the South African EZ and what are their activity patterns like? Are they behaving? If it's registered as a fishing vessel, is it going back and forth like a trawler should? Or is it like making little runs in and out to shore? Or is it sitting there and you have a smaller boat making a run in and out to shore, which would suggest smuggling of some kind? Um, so just having an idea of, of what's going on. There's a lot of um, tuna poaching that happens at the edge of the EZ. Um, so, uh, so the development included analyzing what was needed, selecting someone to essentially build the, the core that's gonna let these tools dock in, and then individually selecting institutes and PIs who were capable of producing decision support tools, um, design and build, user testing and acceptance, and then operations. It's seen as a five-year thing, but frankly, at the end of five years, we will have basically five operational tools, but everybody who's involved can see that you know, we could have two dozen tools that would be really useful. So I think this is probably the first five-year cycle of two or three. Um, so there was a feasibility study in 2012-2013, a procurement phase, um, and I came to South Africa right about, no, I'm just using this pointer, right? Um, right about there. Uh, so the contract was already negotiated and we were actually starting with the design and build stuff. Um, Let's see, what happens next? Okay, so there's another phase, another five-year phase envisioned after this. Um, obviously, we need supporters and people have to speak up and say, yes, this has been worthwhile. So we're in year four of five right now. 
Um, so the conceptual model is, um, it's a pretty picture, right? You take in data, you mush it together in some kind of, you know, algorithms and there's hardware underneath and then you provide it to, um, to users. Um, most of these things, except for the integrated vessel tracking are fully public. Um, with the exception, I guess the search and rescue actual decision thing is, is private. You can get the information about the winds and the currents, but the actual like, where's your search radius thing is, is only available to the National Sea Rescue Institute and the South African Maritime Safety. Um, so, um, again, you've got various kinds of data and they come in and they get georeferenced and they get metadata on them and they get processed using algorithms and one of the things one of the things that I um, was keen on when I came I said okay are the algorithms all published because if you have people making decisions on these and they're not happy with the results of that decision you know how is how was that information how was that advice calculated and the more transparent we are the, the easier it is to, to defend it right here's the algorithm it was peer-reviewed it was published it's, it's in an algorithm theoretical basis document um, or whatever, whatever the appropriate format is. Um, they go into these different little apps and they come out as a, a website or a, basically they're all websites right now. One of the other things that we're grappling with is, um, for example, in the, in the small boat fisheries community, um, most of the uh, fishermen don't have smartphones. So we can provide wonderful information and if we don't make it accessible to them it's absolutely useless so one of the things that happened last year was we got uh, i was part of a delegation to india to look at how they're supporting their small-scale fisheries um and they had developed this cool little led sign weatherproof thing um and they had a bunch of phrases they had a lexicon they have 11 different languages spoken around the coasts in india and the, the all the coastal states um, so they basically can find, issue an alert and then they, their automated translator picks the right phrases from those 11 languages, makes it into a sentence. Um, and then they've taken those signs and they've basically like bolted them on the, like the Harbor Master's office, various places, and they just stream out the information. If there's a hazardous condition or, um, an enhanced fishing area, they, they track ocean fronts and those. So we're probably going to need to do some things like that. We haven't really gotten there yet so far. It's a website. Um, right. These are just different views of different apps that we've got. Um, eventually, uh, mobile support. Um, one of the interesting things has been there are no unified governmental information security standards. So when we do the vessel tracking and we went to the state security agency and said, what are your what are your security requirements for something like this they gave us a list of security requirements that were entirely oriented toward the physical security of the machines that's running the app we're like okay but what about authentication and authorization for the app or um uh, logging and monitoring on the operating system that's running it or they don't have any security standards for that so i said well you know other countries do and um maybe we should just look at some of the standards and pick something that works. You don't have to necessarily develop something. You can, you can pick it and you can, if you pick something like FISMA, then you can read through it and you can say low, moderate, or high, right? You can kind of pick the appropriate level for each different decision support tool. Um, so we're kind of in the middle of that now. It's, it's interesting. Um, that's what the landing page looks like if you hit it. Um, <clears throat> the beta version of OSIMS was released in November. Um, that's the URL, you can go and check it out um, if you're interested. Um, this is just another architecture view of it. Um, basically, you got a lot of data in and you process it and we're trying as much as possible, um, trying to get people to use um, RESTful APIs and stuff so that um, there are other ways to access it and people could also uh, deploy some kind of customized thing for their industry or their company even for the larger fishing companies on top of it. Um, and then you've got your user community, which right now includes people in maritime industries, but also includes a lot of 
governmental organizations like Search and Rescue. Um, SANBI is a South African National Biodiversity Institute, so they're charged with, you know, looking at all these biologically unique areas and making sure they're mapped and protected and things. Um, uh, so as you go to the homepage, you'll see there's an about, there's a, a place to access documents. This is kind of different than most of the um, stuff I worked on when I was at NCEI, where really we were concerned with data sets and the data. Um, here you can actually get um, things like the legislation and the policies and um, relevant stuff. So if you were actually trying to make a decision, what you know, what legislation and, and policies do you actually have to pay attention to? Um, so that's that's an interesting twist. I like it. Um, so right now, um, the data interface is very small and modest, and um, just on a technical end, the OSIMS core is using CCAN for people who um, pay attention to those things. Um, and interestingly, they're using an Esri Geoportal as a, as a back end, um, not as a front end. So um, they've got some data sets loaded there. There's a, um, there is a concept of data sets of record, very similar to here. So um, some of those are, um, are listed here and they've been collected up, um, particularly if our department stewards them. Um, search by keyword. Um, this is kind of a, a, an organizational diagram of how the thing is supposed to work once it's operational. So you've got some kind of IT infrastructure. You've got a management system for data, which is not deployed yet fully. Um, and then you've got a, you know, a development piece and a research to operations piece. And then it gets actually developed into a tool and deployed. And then there's some user feedback and it gets refined. There's administrative management, and then there's the oversight layer. And um, we at Oceans and Coast, although we're not building the core and we're not building the decision support tools, we have a role in most of these layers. So the first one um, that I want to highlight was, um, again, when I was brought into the project and I said, you know, what, what happens when a decision goes wrong or somebody is lost at sea and, you know, the search area that's indicated is, is not the right area and the person isn't recovered or... Um, do, do we have a clear and transparent chain of here are all the, the data that were used to make this decision and here's the algorithm. And um, the system had been designed really from the outside in. So they thought about what they wanted to have and they didn't actually have a data management layer the way that we think of it with tracking for individual granules of data. So um, I'm now um, managing a project to do that um, and that's an internal contribution from our department. Um, and we're really just start. we basically started in February. So um, we have budget. It took a long time to get the contract negotiated to bring in contractors because we actually had no IT posts. Zero. No IT posts. <laughs> um, so now we have a little core IT information systems group. Um, so uh, we've procured some infrastructure. Um, we have a blade server and we have like a quarter of a petabyte of storage so far. And, um, and we're looking at deploying a very standard looking stack of data management tools um, that many people know would be familiar with, including things like Threads and OpenDAP and ERDAP and a Geoportal. And um, so the other thing that um, became clear uh, was so South Africa runs a regional HICOM that's data assimilative. It's not in production yet, but it's getting close. Um, it say it's pretty mature. Uh, they also have a pretty strong community that does bay embayment and harbor scale modeling, mostly based on the Delft 3D model. But um, there was no kind of EEZ scale modeling going on that was designed to go into operations. It was all very academic. So we're now supporting um, essentially development of an operational ROMs for the coastal zone. So um, like I said, I kind of saw where, where we could contribute to this would be to look for critical gaps that weren't covered in the contract, so they weren't going to be developed, and then see if we could find internal resources to fill those gaps. So um, that should be starting really soon. And then, of course, we provide project oversight and, and direction. 
Um, so, like I said, motivate. Another critical observing gap was um, knowledge of surface currents. We don't have um, we don't have an NDBC. We don't have any. Um, well, there are, there are eight um, like Wave Rider Mark II or Mark VII buoys that sit just outside of the ports, right outside of South Africa's shipping ports, um, and that's it in terms of operational observing infrastructure that's in the ocean. That's it. That's all the country has. So, um, and like I said, when I really started looking at the marine conditions and the, the actual infrastructure for putting things out to sea, I quickly came to the decision that HF radar would, would do a lot and would be feasible. So um, one of the things I'm working on this year is um, going around to different government departments that would be stakeholders like the Navy and Defense Intelligence and Naval Intelligence and and fisheries and saying, wouldn't it be great if you had a knowledge, a real-time knowledge of ocean surface currents at this kind of scale, and would you participate in a proposal to Treasury to to do a pilot and look at the options that are, because there are quite a lot of commercial providers, and um, maybe think about, you know, putting in a motivation to actually start rolling that out for the country. Um, so uh, we're hoping we might have a pilot um, next fiscal year. Um, so um, for the for the actual data management layer, um, it's called the Marine Information Management System, and it is really an information management system. Um, and there's a key piece down here. So the actual file level management will be a piece of open source NOAA software from NCI. Thank you, NCI. Um, so I've been spending a lot of time talking to folks upstairs about um, where they are and what they're doing and um, what pieces we should try and deploy now and where we should wait for the next release. And um, this graphic is courtesy of Ken Casey. I stole it from him. Um, so a very um, a very standard stack of, of you know, publicly supported and available protocols. There's, a, I mean, there's NOAA software further up the stack here too, right? LAS and ERDAP. Um, so one that was new to me, this was developed by an Australian department, I can't think of who it was. Um, it's a very interesting um, protocol that serves out uh, gridded data that's in NetCDF, and it keeps a little database of um, like kind of like file level metadata so that um, you don't have to know a lot about it. Um, so it's kind of similar to some of the GUIs that run on top of um, OpenDAP, but um, maybe a little slicker. Um, Anyway, so as much as possible, we're trying not to invent anything that doesn't need to be invented, just leveraging community provided tools that support RESTful protocols. And um, I, as part of this, we're also going to take over the South, Southern African Data Center for Oceanography. So essentially, the MIMS that I'm presenting here is going to become the National Oceanographic Data Center for South Africa as of November. So I'm a little scared, <laughs> but that's where we are. Um, that had been a contract. Um, and I argued pretty strongly when I came there that, that long-term stewardship of data is an inherent government function and you can't contract it out because if you don't have enough money to support the contract, the contractor isn't inherently interested in, in doing it and maintaining it and making it better. And um, whereas your department does, you will scramble and scratch for resources. To, and case in point, the SADCO interface, which I used to access, I did my PhD on oceanography of south of Africa, um, was in the late 80s and early 90s, like um, state of the art. And it is still the same interface now. It has not been upgraded at all. <laughs> so um, yeah, so we basically said, we're gonna have to do this to support OSIMS and even just to, to support um, the non-physical types of data that our department collects, which desperately need to be cataloged and organized and better disseminated. And so while we're doing this, we could easily take in the data that SADCO has and, and provide it through a much more modern software stack. And they decided that we will officially take that over in SADCO. Essentially, SADCO will migrate to us, the name. Um, so uh, tools, this, this is where we get to the interesting thing. Um, so we've got the integrated vessel tracking, harmful algal bloom, uh, the coastal viewer, which is a bunch, it's a bunch of GIS layers that you could use to make decisions about um, using the coast. Uh, coastal hazards is under development. Um, 
South Africa is very fortunate in having most of their four coastal provinces. They're fairly large. And three out of four have been mapped using LIDAR. So they have digital elevation maps that are pretty good. And um, uh, right now, what we have is bathtub flooding model. But um, I'm not clear on the details, but there are plans to improve that um, for things like storm surge inundation. Um, and uh, yeah, so that one's under development. Different sea level rises and storm frequencies can be simulated. Um, so that's just showing what it looks like in areas where we have a lot of data. Um, coastal hazards, alpha version was released. Um, this is supposed to be a video that shows you, this is Cape Town, um, last almost exactly a year ago, I think it's a year and two weeks. Um, and it won't play, I'm told. But if you, if you watch this, a wave basically overtops these palm trees and comes flooding down the street and sweeps the car from which this video was taken, like, and then you can hear everyone swearing, going, wow, and, you know, getting out into, you know, knee-deep water. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, storm surge inundation is a real thing for South Africa. So I hope this doesn't freeze the whole presentation. Let's see, where should I be pointing? There we go. Okay. Um, another example is the Coastal Viewer. Um, it just has all kinds of data that you would need. These are mostly data that are not dynamic, right? Like, well, not terribly dynamic, like high water mark and things. Um, one of the other things that South Africa is grappling with as a country is we don't have an official um, mean water level, like line for people to use for planning or high water mark. Or, um, and uh, so what happens is provinces sort of declare their own and they use it because they have to. Right, and then there are disagreements and things. So that's one of the things that we're trying to, to bump up in priority is we really need to have an authoritative one. Who is gonna be the steward of that? Who, who, who is the source of that authoritative information? Um, and uh, we had a really interesting talk from the Naval Hydrographic Office about the misuse of watermarks. Um, so, um, so from this, you can get things like the boundaries of properties and uh, rivers and estuary mouths and where there are blue flag beaches and coastal discharges and um, where there are access points to the coast, all kinds of information that you need to conduct coastal planning. Um, this is, I think, one of the most interesting ones. And it's certainly been one of the ones that's generated the most excitement. As I mentioned, this is a unique algorithm for South Africa that detects uh, the presence of harmful algal blooms. Um, I believe the production version is uh, currently using MODIS, but they're developing an algorithm for Sentinel. Sentinel-3, would it be? Um, and that should be coming online soon if it's not already online. Um, there are several things that happen. I've already mentioned the land-based um, Aquaculture, but the other thing that happens during a bloom, not necessarily harmful algae, but just an algal bloom, is um, on the west coast, um, once the bloom is quite mature and stuff is sinking down to the bottom, it creates um, oxygen depleted zones. And if the circulation is right, those oxygen depleted patches basically come close inshore. And there's there's a big um, crayfish, rock lobster fishery. It's a, I don't think it's very high in volume, but it's very high in value. Um, and those lobsters respond by walking shoreward. And if the nearshore circulation is such that that oxygen depleted patch keeps getting shallower, the lobsters will actually walk out onto the beach where they die. So um, an early warning of that, the, basically our department is charged with providing a warning. The fisheries department has a response unit, which consists of fisheries people, fisheries enforcement people, and fishermen all up and down the West Coast who have pickup trucks. And they basically, you know, fill them with seaweed and they go down to the beach and they pick up the lobsters and they drive them 50 miles up the coast and put them back in. And it's remarkably successful. So if they know this is going to happen, um, they can actually save a lot of the lobsters. And um, somebody asked me yesterday, how do they know how far to go? Well, they have to go far enough where they don't see lobsters walking out on the beach and then probably a little further just to be safe. Um, as far as we know so far, they're, they're very locally generated events. So if you do get out of the immediate zone, it's probably as safe as anywhere else. Um, so um, yeah, the, the aquaculturists have been really enthusiastic about this and a, and a um, 
a big support. Um, so this also is in its beta release. Integrated vessel tracking. Oh, this probably won't play either. Um, so yeah, um, you can you can look for foreign flag vessels. This is based on AIS, and then will be based on VDES when that comes in. Both satellite-based information and shore-based information, and also defense has shore-based radar, um, vessel detection radar. Um, so you can easily see which vessels are inside the EEZ that are not licensed to operate there. Um, there are other problems that that doesn't address. So hopefully, so this is a was a basically a test case that was run um, to look at how useful synthetic aperture radar data could be in compliance and enforcement. Um, it was a month-long campaign in 2015, um, and they got um, eight 500 kilometer by 500 kilometer images. This is one of those two Prince Edward Islands. I think this is Marion Island, but don't quote me on that, okay? Um, I'm pretty sure it's Marion Island. So um, the imagery that they acquired covered 80% of the EEZ around Marion Island. Um, I think it's 80% after you get your two weekly images, but I could be wrong about that. Um, so five images contained vessels who had turned off their AIS transponders, which is not a good thing to do, particularly, I mean, that's just, that's a very, just, unless you're the Navy, you shouldn't be doing that. Um, so there's the island. Okay, so the island in this picture is this little dot, and here's the EEZ in red. There's the first image that was acquired. There's the second image. Together, they cover 80% of the EEZ. Easy. Um, okay, so in the this image, there were two dark targets. That's the 23rd of June, 2015, um, 250 kilometers south of the island. Um, again, on July 3rd, two vessels again. Again, on July 10th, the vessels are still there. What the heck are they doing there? Um, okay, so if you look at all the image they, images they acquired, they got 10 images that contained a dark target. Um, there is a huge uh, marine protected zone around the island, um, and it's got, it's got one of those <sighs> Patagonian toothfish. What's, what's the actual name for that fish? I can't think of it. Anyway, one of those things that reproduces really slowly, you're never supposed to eat it. It's on all those like red lists. <laughs> there are lots of them here, and people fish for them illegally. Um, and in this case, um, the SAR imagery was able to confirm that one of these dark targets was fishing in a marine protected zone. Um, and it's, uh, I gather from this that it's a South African flag vessel called the Koryomaru uh, number 11. Um, and this won't play. But um, one of the things that they're considering doing is using these um, wave, so wave, rider, wave riders, wave gliders. wave gliders, okay, to, so if they had them circling around that, the island, which is basically uninhabited, um, and they saw that there was a dark target, they can have it poodle over and actually take a picture to identify the vessel. So they're considering that. I don't know, I don't know how feasible it is, but I know it's under consideration. I haven't had much to do with that. Um, so this was another type of um, activity that was able to be seen really for the first time using this integrated tool. So this is now a small, a small scale fisherman leaving from a um, little coastal town. The boat goes out of sight, looking like it's going to the fishing um, area. And as soon as it's actually out of sight of the coastal towns, they do a U-turn and they come back and they start fishing in a marine protected area, thinking that nobody can see them. <laughs> so this was a um, successful interdictment. Um, so there's a lot of data that goes into the integrated vessel tracking, um, and those data are acquired by a lot of different government departments. So it's been a huge coordination exercise that Nimalon basically accomplished um, to get it all together. There's Department of DOT and Department of Defense and um, us with all our maps of the coastal zone and what goes on and uh, Lloyd's register and getting the AIS data, which comes through the fisheries department. Um, 
so they've they've had several successful I don't know what they are prosecutions or you know nabbing nabbing people doing bad things in the fisheries um, and it's been so successful that um, some of the departments involved like defense and the navy said could we have some more money to add some more features to this that that we think are really critical and it, it was successful so that's a cool success story marine spatial planning i've already described so i'm going to kind of skip through this but like i said it's it's designed to give you layers of the coastal zone to allow you to see where you have potentially conflicting uses um operations at sea um so i chair the um technical advisory group on this because i am a physical oceanographer this the idea of this um decision support tool is basically to provide people with um, wind, swell conditions, stuff like that, um, so they know whether or not they can conduct their operation, whether that be oil exploration or fishing in their tiny boat. Um, a tough one for us is fog. The, the small boat fishermen in South Africa are typically operating without even a compass, so they, did, they, they rely heavily on line of sight, and fog is a huge risk for them. So one of the other things that we're looking at, and one of those gap-filling things is um, working with some of the coastal communities to see if, for example, we could have a pole with a horn and a light. And if we think it's going to be foggy, you know, you start that alert. Because they're usually just a few kilometers offshore. They're not going out far. Um, so um, uh, the National Sea Rescue Institute is a, um, is a voluntary organization. 97% of its operating budget is from contributions. It gets 3% of its operating budget from the government. And they basically have a contract to do all the near shore search and rescue. There is no Coast Guard in South Africa. So they do all the near shore search and rescue. That would be out to like 25 miles offshore, not more than that. Um, and after that, it's ships of opportunity or the, or the Navy, basically. Um, so uh, they were doing all of their search calculations by hand on pencil and paper. Um, so they would, if they know there's a person overboard, they would throw something over that's got approximately the same drift characteristics as a body, and they'd watch it for a few minutes and you know look at the compass direction and the rate of drift and assume that when that person went overboard, the conditions are like they are now because they had no other information, and make a calculation of where to search and go. So um, this tool now, uh, they can basically uh, cut and paste or type in information about the location and stuff. And it's using, uh, it's using CFS or ECMWF winds, um, which is an ideal, but it's a huge improvement because now you can say the object went into the water four hours ago. What were the winds like then? Please give me a projected drift. Um, this is another community that would be vastly um, assisted by having a real-time knowledge of surface currents, obviously. Um, so, uh, and in a few of the larger embayments, we actually do have Delft three models running that would then be put into operational mode. But unfortunately, it's only there's only three embayments that are currently um, uh, currently modeled like that. Um, but again, it's an improvement. It's a huge improvement. They're very enthusiastic about it. Um, and the developers have been working closely with them. So um, I just wanted to briefly talk about, you know, where South Africa is in terms of modeling. I've already mentioned we have a regional HICOM running that's data assimilative. It's not operational yet. It's pre-operational. I think, I think it's a couple of years from being operational. Um, and then we as a department are trying to support the development of operational ROMs. I haven't taken the step, the, the modeling, the ROMs modeling, I'm not a modeler. The ROMS modeling community in South Africa is heavily oriented toward the French version of ROMS, ROMS of Grief, um, which doesn't do any data assimilation. It's a different branch of ROMS than like the Rutgers um, or the UCLA ROMS um, that all are data assimilative. So um, one of my targets is um, I feel that on the west coast of South Africa, given the conditions and all, probably a non-data assimilative ROMS, sufficient resolution, um, that's nested in a data assimilative high common getting its boundary conditions would probably perform pretty well because we don't have the gullus current on the west coast. On the east coast, it's probably never going to perform well until we actually do data assimilation, direct data assimilation realm. So, you know, my five year goal is let's have operational realms, and my 10 year goal is let's have data assimilative <laughs> operational realms, but we're going to have to train some people up to use the other flavor of realms. So, 
um, I've sort of put that out there, like, we're using ROMs at Grateful. Why don't you think about investigating those other ROMs? Um, and then we have a, a bunch of different Bay and Harbor scale models that can be. And those, obviously, once you've got all the regional model and the coastal model, you can nest them. And there is quite a strong community um, that's capacitated to do that type of modeling. So hopefully we can just, just add them one by one. Um, so that's our vision is to have coupled downscaling and actually get into forecast mode. Um, even even a 48 hour forecast would be a huge plus. So there's no forecasting available for South Africa at all that's that's regional. They just use the global forecasts right now. Um, one of the things we've identified as a need, there is no national operational high performance computing center that would have capacity to do this. So we're teaming up with the weather service and somebody else was interested. Um, mostly the weather service and us though, um, to actually motivate for that. Um, and um, then a third piece of that is um, having very strong ocean currents on its eastern coast. South Africa really needs a local instantiation of wave watch that includes ocean current interaction. Um, and so at that we're hoping to get online within um, a couple of years. So um, there have been some direct benefits. There have been some lobster rescues. There's been some interdiction of um, looted squid on trawlers that were behaving suspiciously. Um, we're in the fourth year of five, um, so mostly what I've been doing is trying to raise internal resources to support this project, to basically motivate and say, we've got to have ROMs. That is the international best practice, is to have HICOM and ROMs, and then your Bay and Harbor scale. You can't just go from HICOM to Bay and Harbor scale and skip that all-important kind of um, continental shelf scale model at one to two kilometers resolution. Um, we have to have an IT infrastructure. We have to be ready to receive this thing. We can't just say, you know, oh, here's your tool, and then we don't have a server or a system administrator or anybody who knows about these APIs or these different things. So um, we've got our little tiny IT team. We're putting up the information management system that will be a back-end support for this, um, as well as organizing the millions of kinds of data that we actually collect and generate. Um, it's on track. Uh, there are millions of different partners um, involved in this, the provinces, the new South African National Space Agency, the Weather Service, tourism, you name it. And as I mentioned, some of these departments don't actually, haven't had working relationships before because they're, they're still figuring out what their mandate is and stuff. So that's, um, this is one of the first real cross-cutting, cross-departmental projects that I've seen in South Africa and it, um, it took a while but it's really going well now. People are seeing the benefit of that. Um, and they're seeing, they're seeing how well it works if you do say, you don't have the capacity yet, we'll, we'll do it for you until you have it. And then, and then you can take it on. You wanna have that expense, <laughs> go for it. You know? um, so yeah, getting all the key players involved. Take home messages. I don't remember what's on the slide. This will be exciting for all of us. Right, despite initial mistrust, <laughs> OSINS is now getting good support from stakeholders. Um, it's on track and on budget, and that has nothing to do with me. I've done a lot to try and move the budget up and get us more budget. But um, And so we have some foci this year, including things like oil spill. South Africa currently has no oil spill detection and tracking capability at all, which is something that wakes me up in the middle of the night, because it's our department that's supposed to be doing that. Um, so we would use SAR to detect it. We desperately need a good resolution shelf scale model to then project where it's gonna go. We don't have that yet. Um, we need interoperability. Um, some of these things need to become more operational. Um, and a big one, of course, is, is actually doing analyses um, to show the benefits. So um, branding and selling, okay. Uh, yes, and we, we love people to exercise it and give us feedback. Um, even, you know, people who are oceanographers here or to do e ecosystems management of some kind, go take a look. Tell us what you think because it's really, it's really useful. Um, especially from people who have experience with systems like this because things will pop out to you that just wouldn't have occurred to the developers there. Like the fact that they needed an information management system on the back end. They just hadn't quite got there. Um, thank you.
in the room? We're online. Um, yeah, so the question was the University of Cape Town. In fact, I'm not sure you would have seen any uh, universities. Can I, can I go back on this or am I out of my presentation? Now? Okay, um, so where are the academic partners? Um, boop, 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 boop. Okay, um, I don't think you'll see, okay, you see the Cape Peninsula University of Technology uh, because they specifically have a, a development to operations Thing for, for gear, like buoys and drones and stuff. Um, OSINS is designed to take stuff that's fairly mature and roll it out, the R to O piece. Um, everybody recognizes it's very important to have the universities, but um, it's, a, it's a more informal connection, I think. It's not directly through this project. So one of the things I did start when I came to South Africa was a working group on research to operational oceanography, because there wasn't one. So we have good participation from the universities there and we listen to what they're doing and we tell them what our needs are and you know um so for example we'll we'll put our names on proposals if we think it's something that could develop into something that's useful for the country but no they're not formally involved with us um they could be if you had a university that was developing stuff that's quite mature um that's really designed to go into operations absolutely they could do a decision support tool and there is actually one tool called abalobi it was designed to meet needs of small-scale fishermen in terms of, um, it was originally to help them set prices for their catches so they don't get um, taken advantage of when they bring their catch in. That's now also providing them with uh, warnings about rough conditions and things. And, and again, informally, we're, we're working with them so that all the information that we have about sea conditions from this would go into their API and would be available. Um, but there's no exchange of funds for that, and it's, it's just a best effort type of thing. Any more questions in the room or online? Okay. So it's it's really amazing how much funding that computers. Yeah. It's not really me. I mean, it's a lot of people, but. Um, Let me think of it. Yeah. The, um, my question, two questions about technology and policy. So one of the cool things about not having the HPC systems that you don't have on the market today. And yeah. I wonder if at this early acquisition phase, either your particular agency or the entire federal government has talked about the role of the cloud and how that can supplant only the HPC system. Um, yeah. A lot, of, a lot of that going on here, but we also have the responsibility to maintain an already large investment in the HPC. So yeah. Um, yeah, okay, so he's saying um, it's great that we don't have HPC yet because we don't have the responsibility of maintaining an HPC infrastructure, which is very expensive, which I totally agree. Um, We've looked at the cloud um, in particular uh, for satellite image processing, which isn't really true HPC. That's more high throughput computing. Um, that's some, something I have experience with from having been at NESDIS. Um, and there were definitely resources out there. I mean, for example, um, the EU has put up a big cloud and if you're using Sentinel data. So that's definitely a possibility. I don't, I don't know enough about true HPC, like running these weather models and stuff. Can you do that in the cloud yet? Is the weather service here trying to do that, for example? Um, and I'm not saying you should answer that, but like that's the first thing I would look at is other weather services around the world. What are they doing and, and how well is it? Has anybody moved into Amazon? Um, when I looked at um, cloud stuff um, when I was here, it was still more expensive than doing stuff in-house, partly because they there are economies of scale, but you're essentially, you have the same requirement that you did, except now there's also like an advertising and um, a commercial budget on top of that, that you're paying that the provider has to support rather than doing something cheaply in-house. So yeah, um, I can see pros and cons. Um, South Africa also suffers from a real bandwidth limitations. And so it would have to be a, a cloud that's somewhere on the continent. Um, I think Amazon has a facility in Johannesburg. Yeah, that's actually one of the benefits. Yeah. Is, is you have them do the data replication and not do it yourself. Yeah, no, that's that's um that's a really interesting question, and that is probably something that we should look at seriously. What I, what I've been trying to do more is just identify who needs it because South Africa does have a research center for high performance computing, 
but they queue things. You put your job there and they queue it and they'll run it in a couple of weeks and they'll tell you when your results are available. And that totally doesn't work, obviously, for operational models. So um, every time we've suggested to the Department of Science and Technology that we have a need like this, they're like, well, you should use a center for high performance computing. I'm like, no, 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 no. We need an operational center. We need something where we can say this has to run at 2 a.m. every day and then this, this thing has to run at 4 a.m. after it. And um, we're slowly getting there. So once we have a comprehensive list of requirements, then we can start chopping them out. You know, um, and uh, that's that's a you know that's an interesting question. Uh, thank you, Dr. Byrne, for coming in. Uh, we are out of time, so if anyone online or in the room has questions, uh, you can send them to library.brownbag at noaa.gov, and I will make sure that those uh, get to you, Dr. Byrne. So thank you again. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks.